Hey everyone, Gil Gross here, and it is time for another mailbag where I answer your inquiries, your observations, your takes, and ultimately your comments about tennis and other things. About 24 hours ago, I posted on the YouTube community tab. I also posted on my Twitter account, at Gil underscore Gross. Link is in the description. I have selected 34 comments that I am excited to respond to as we uh, inch closer towards Madrid. Exciting action this week in Barcelona and in Serbia for the men, Stuttgart and Istanbul for the women, and a lot of off-the-court news as well, especially yesterday, crazy day, for a couple of reasons. Uh, so I get to your comments after a quick shout-out to play your court. The place to go if you're looking for a local coach, practice partner, or match. The weather is turning. It is warm. Summer is coming. Spring is here. Play some tennis. Playercourt.com backslash Gilgros. 50% discount. Link is in the description. Someone told me that's a forward slash. I guess that's a forward slash, not a backslash. Uh, okay. My bad. All right. Let's get to this first comment. And it comes from Twitter, all about tennis blog, my friend David. Uh, would you love to hear your thoughts on IMG wildcard selections to Madrid and whether you think it's a big deal at all? And then Beverly under it says, I second that. I think it's a big deal. Madrid is Spain's equivalent to their Grand Slam. Like all other slams, local and worthy talent should get first dibs. So... There was controversy about the wild cards. The Spanish players were upset. Fernando Verdasco didn't get a wild card. And with all the things he's accomplished in his career, and, you know, this the fact, you know, you'd think he'd get a wild card. Verdasco's a player, you'd think he'd get a wild card. Um, on the men's side, only one Spaniard got one, and none of the women. So the wild cards went to Andy Murray, Carlos Jimeno, who is the only Spaniard, uh, Lucas Puy, Jack Draper, and then the women, it went to Osaka, Linda Fruvertova, Monica Puig, who's back, uh, Marta Kostyuk, and Zhang Xinwen. And the reason why Spanish players didn't get wild cards is because Tyriac, what's his first name again? Um, what was his name? Tyriac. Oh, uh, Ian Tyriac uh, used to own Madrid, also the... Davis Cup architect of like the new Davis Cup. He sold it to IMG. And, you know, under Tyriac's ownership, the wild cards went to Spanish players. And since Tyriac is Romanian, it would also go to some Romanians. So let's talk about wild cards. There's a lot going on here because there's also Andy Murray. Uh, Murray, since his comeback, has only qualified, has only had direct entry into like two tournaments. He's gotten like 30 wild cards out of 32 main draw appearances. So people are also starting to question, well, when when is this too, too many wild cards for Murray? When does he stop deserving these wild cards? So it's a two-pronged question. But I think the overall theme of this is wild cards are not fair at all. They are by definition not fair. That's kind of the point. The point is they're wild. To take uh, a tweet from uh, my co-host on three, Amy Lundy, who said uh, they're wild. Yeah, it, they, what matters? Sometimes it's where you're from. And then what if you're a player who's from an untraditional, you know, uh, obviously, you know, Americans and uh, French, they're going to get more wild cards just because of where they were born. That's not fair. But sometimes it can be where you're from. Sometimes it is going to be your agency and who owns the tournament. That's not really fair either. Uh, sometimes it's going to be how entertaining you are. Well, is that fair? I mean, wild cards are not fair. They have never been fair. They're not supposed to be fair. The only thing that's fair is if you qualify for the tournament, then you get to play. That's fair. Or if you make a rule, these are the qualifications for the tournament. So uh, it's tough. What are my thoughts on these IMG wildcards? It feels slimy. It does. 
it feels like a conflict of interest. It is a conflict of interest. However, in order to actually get upset, you know, in order to waste your energy on it, you have to think about, well, what's the solution here? What's the reform? And the reality is you got to get rid of wild cards if you want these things to change. I, I can't see a world in which you have wild cards uh, because if you are IMG, of course you're going to do this. You own the tournament. The rules are, as the owner of the tournament, you get to choose your wild cards. Of course you're going to choose your clients. Now let's talk about the Murray situation. You're a tournament director. Your job is to create interest for fans and sponsors. Of course you're going to give Andy Murray a wild card. And at no point is it about whether or not he deserves it. There's a good argument that he does with all the things he's accomplished in his career. But then when does that run out? I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is you have a job to do. You've been hired to put on the most profitable tournament that you can possibly put on. Of course, you're going to give Andy Murray a wild card. And it has nothing to do with whether or not he deserves it. This is a, you know, he is a star. He is someone who people are interested in. That's it. So as long as that is the system, we are never going to get any semblance of fairness in wild cards. And I, to me, you, need, you either need to accept that or advocate that wild cards will be no longer. Or you can advocate for reform in Murray's case that there's some kind of rule that limits the number of wild cards that the same player can get in one season. However, where is the where is the incentive for the tours or the tournaments to actually want that? Right now they have full control. Right now they get to decide who's in their tournaments. They love that control. They don't want that taken away from them. So what's going to change here? In my opinion, nothing. Wild cards will continue to be what they are. Not fair. And at a certain point, there just needs to be some, I guess, acceptance there because I don't see that ever changing. Fairness is not the point of wild cards. Entertainment is. Money is. In some cases, satisfying uh, the interests of the t tournament directors is. Okay, let us move on now to Jacob. Looking at Nadal's comeback this season, there are several parallels to Federer's 2017 comeback season. Both were coming back from serious injuries. Both had to win a couple of five-setters, including a five-set uh, final to win the title. Both continued to have very good results. Both were the same age. Which of the two comeback seasons did you find most impressive so far? Which of the two, Federer's 2017 season or Nadal's 2022 season, do you think will be better overall? Just as a barometer, keep in mind Federer won two slams, three masters, two 500s, made the quarters of the U.S. Open and the semis of the World Tour final, and beat Nadal four times that year. I guess for Nadal, the parallel would be beating Medvedev. He's beaten him so far twice. Uh, so I, I guess, you know, if that were to continue, that would be certainly something. Uh, I mean, you know, right now, Nadal getting injured at Indian Wells and losing in that final puts, you know, gives puts Federer ahead in, in that question so far. I don't think I need to go any any further than that. We will see what happens. Obviously, Nadal has uh, needs to win that second major. And you, you know me, I don't really like to predict that far in advance as far as who's going to win the majors. So right now, Federer's in the lead, but it will be interesting after the season's over to, to go back and look at that. Uh, then another question here is, based on what you have seen so far with Sviantec and Nadal and the ATP WTA field, which of the two do you give the greater odds to win the French this year? I think Nadal has much stiffer competition than Sviantec looking at Roland Garros. Now, Sviantec, there might be more names who you can throw out there as like the tier two contenders because Iga's in tier one and there's nobody with her. 
if you make a tier two, you might have a long list of tier two players, but I don't break down the men's field like that. I really don't. I break down, you know, depending on what CT Pass looks like, I break down the men's field as including Djokovic, assuming he gets back to fitness, it's looking like he will. Djokovic, Nadal, again, assuming health, and and CT Pass, and then we got to keep an eye on Alcaraz and see where he's at. Uh, that's your tier one. You have multiple players in tier one, and Iga to me stands alone in tier one. So I think Iga. And then the last part of this question is what inspired you to do a vlog with your girlfriend a few years back? Have you considered doing another vlog for one of the majors? What inspired me to do it is I was there with my girlfriend. That's all. Um, and if, if I was in the same situation again, I would, I would definitely do it again. Um, yeah, I would, I would like to do more of those. I would, uh, just have to kind of the the right things need to fall into place and I need to be at an event not working uh you know and with with someone whether it be Jenna or, or someone else where, where I could I could do it so yeah I'd, I'd love to do that again I've done two by the way you could also look up I was at the city open in uh 2018 and that was like the first that was the next gen breakthrough 2018 city open it was demon or Rublev and Titi Pass and Zverev. Those were the four semifinalists. And uh, one of my one of my best friends, Billy, um, was with me for that. So I've done a City Open vlog, and I've done that French Open vlog with uh, with my girlfriend. Next one comes from Novak Fan England on Twitter. Uh, why are the PTPA being criticized over the Russian players being banned from Wimbledon, but no journalists are questioning any of the ATP players' counsel, namely Federer, Nadal, Kevin Anderson, and Andy Murray? This is in a lot of people's minds. Well, I haven't seen criticism of the PTPA. I, I only saw one tweet from uh, from Ben Rothenberg criticizing the statement that the PTPA came out with, saying that it, that it uh, was kind of inopportune and wasn't really saying much and, and wasn't effective, I guess. Uh, but I haven't really seen any criticism of the PTPA. But uh, my my overall thoughts on on the PTPA, and I'll talk about the Players' Council in this too, is this. They are both pretty irrelevant and ineffective. I mean, that's the reality about both of these organizations. Uh, the Players' Council, uh, I have not, there has not been a single instance in which the Players' Council has had enough bargaining power or leverage to put its foot down over any issue in a in any visible manner, manner that I can remember. Uh, that is to say that at no point in time has there ever been a, a tour interest or an interest coming from one of the slams, the ATP, the WTA, the ITF, that the Players' Council has actually come in and exercised their power and, you know, gotten more for the players. So, you know, the player council is ineffective and the PTPA uh, in the same breath has done absolutely nothing about anything. I mean, they are, they are just uh, right now an organization in principle. Their ideas are, are all uh, some, somewhat abstract, but all good, but they have, you know, I, I don't know what, what they have done at any point since their creation either. So right now, the players have no power. They, for the most part, get stepped on and run over. And, and that's, that's where we're at right now. Ryan J. Hi, Gil. Do you think that this Wimbledon controversy has put a spotlight on the structure of the tour? I can't think of another sport where individual events have the power to make decisions at this level, especially without consultation from the players. Not to mention the French Open moving the schedule without player input. Do you think Wimbledon going robe will cause more discussion about the power that Grand Slams have? Yeah, yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? This is. It's a crazy sport. You, uh, you know, we saw this with what Roland Garros did in 2020, and uh, we've we've seen this repeatedly. At least all the now every uh, every slam has the same tiebreak rule. So at least we got on the same page in that respect. Will this shed spotlight on that? Look, the divided structure 
of tennis it comes to light about you know two times every year so this is another instance of that but it is what it is, you know, may, maybe there are some good, maybe you could see some positives in this as well, in, in the way it's structured. I don't know. Maybe. Let's see. Did I answer this question? Do you think Wimbledon will cause more discussion about the power the slams have? No, because the slams generate 60% of the revenue. So that's power. <laughs> I feel like this mailbag's been funny. I feel like it's a lot about uh, politics and you know, money and stuff like that. But I don't know. That's how it is. So, yeah, I mean, I don't see anything getting in the way of the power that the slams have. And I don't see that changing. Here's one from Kailash. Hi, Gil. Always await these mailbags. I have a different kind of question. Do you think that a great player does not necessarily become a great coach? The best coaches in the world, even from 2010s to present, like Roger Rashid, Larry Stefanke, Magnus Norman... And the likes were good players, possibly top 100 or 200, yet made great coaches. Let us know whether you concur and your thoughts on on this and why you think it's this way. I think it's very simple. And I think, yeah, most great coaches were not great players, in my opinion. Uh, or at least they were not. I mean, you know, the word great is uh, can, can go a lot of different directions. But look, the, the all-time great players in the sport, most of them uh, have not made great coaches, with some exceptions. Um, and then when you when you dip down to a low, even lower level, you know, developmental coaches, junior coaches, some of them are are, are amazing tennis minds, uh, just different from touring coaches. Even more so, they they usually weren't great players, or uh, you know, they sustained an injury, or they didn't have the physical tools. And uh, the reason for this is I don't think that difficult, and I've seen this across other sports as well, by the way, uh, especially in football and uh, a good amount in basketball as well, because players who lack physical tools or don't have as much talent need to think harder. And... Uh, Though you know they're often they they feel like they have to be smarter, and that's why they they make great coaches. You know, players with incredible natural ability don't they just don't have to think as much, generally speaking. Um, and then sometimes it's just a matter of uh, I don't know wanting to stay in the game. You know, I, I know I again I know of some coaches who have had a lot of injuries and they just weren't ready to leave the sport, so that they they put everything into coaching where a player who, who has had a long, illustrious career, after they're done with tennis, they might be like, okay, I'm good. I, I can move on now. And by the way, I think the same thing is true with comment uh, commentary. I don't really think there's a parallel between great player and great commentator or analyst, I mean, in this case. I just think that some players see the game, end up seeing the game more clearly and better than others. And of course, some players are better communicators than others. And that is the a key skill in not just coaching, but also commentary is communication. And obviously, your ability to hit serves and forehands have nothing to do with your ability to be a great communicator. So it makes sense that there's not a perfect parallel between being a good coach and being a great player. This one from Ryan. Why do you think Sinner has been receiving so much crowd support recently, even when he isn't the home player? So first, let me answer that. Uh, Miami, I didn't understand why. I don't think there's a big Italian population in Miami. Could be completely wrong about that. Could be wrong. But um, I didn't think there was. Monte Carlo makes sense. The Italians always get tons of support. Uh, but also, it's, it's that he's engaging the crowd now. And um, I think people always kind of wanted to get behind Sinner. Young player, exciting player. Even though we got a lot of hate in my comments, that one mailbag I did uh, about the your least favorite players, uh, I do think that that he is a somewhat popular player. I think crowds have wanted to get behind him, and he's just giving them uh, giving them a lot now, showing them that how much he cares, and that always helps. By the way, he's also played a lot of epic matches, three setters, match points saved. So that's another factor. 
Uh, the second part of this is, do you see past COVID infections causing endurance and fitness problems for tennis players, especially considering Djokovic possibly had it twice? I've heard of track athletes who have suffered a huge dip in performance for weeks and months after contracting COVID, but it seems like tennis players who've had it have been okay physically thoughts. All I can do with the question like this is uh, respond based on... Um, based on players who I've seen have it, and then how have their results been? And there have been a few players, I mean, I, I think most players have been fine. There have been a couple of players who have totally been affected by this. Uh, the the I think the most severe one is Tiago Seaboth Wild. Or as he says on the ATP, I don't know if this is how people are going to say his name. Um, he says Vield. So Tiago Seaboth Vield. And he had a great trajectory great tra trajectory and was I, I think he's you know 20 21 years old now i mean covid just completely derailed him i actually haven't oops i haven't checked on his results in a while so let me check now but uh he's one player there's also david gafan uh who's just starting to come back now i mean his results and i, I don't know if it's because of covid or, or not but his results have not been or were not the same and you can draw a direct line immediately after he got COVID. Uh, it took a while for Dimitrov. He was affected a lot by COVID in 2020. Uh, yeah, I mean, Seaboth Veald has become a sub-500 player at the challenger level. I, I don't know what happened, and I don't know what's happening. But physically, he hasn't looked very good. I can tell you that. Um. I, I hope that we see him back to full strength soon. So yeah, I mean we've we've seen him affect some players, and there's no doubt that that is uh, a risk. You know, I don't know what percent it is, but it's a risk. Uh, Gold Wolf, Gold Wolf, finally getting in the mailbag. Real question for you, Choco Gill. What are your thoughts about players getting booed? Is it fair? Should the players suck it up when they get booed? Is it okay if they cry or lash out at the crowd? Should fans get ejected? Well, this is a topical question because Kyrie Irving in the NBA playoffs, player for the Boston Celtics for our international audience who doesn't follow the NBA. I feel like the NBA is much more, much more global though than the other American sports, baseball and football. Anyway, um, and Kyrie was like going right back at the crowd. I mean, he was chirping them right back. He flipped the bird on some some fans. And uh, then also you have the Naomi Osaka incident when player a uh, fan at Indian Wells said, I think, uh, Naomi, you suck. And Naomi completely broke down and lost because of it. I think it is fair for fans to boo and to express themselves. I think it is part of the experience of attending a sporting event. And in tennis, there is a clear etiquette that should be followed, which is you do it in between points and not before serves and not before first and second serves. And as long as you are within those guidelines, then I think fans should be able to say, uh, should be able to be critical and they should be able to boo or say you stink. I think they said you stink. I don't even think suck. Uh, I don't think it should get personal. I don't think it should ever be threatening. All of these things should should be should force a removal from the event. But short of that, yeah, I think it's part of the experience of going to a sporting event is that you get to express yourself that way. And uh, now for players, is it okay if they lash out? Is it? Do I have an issue with what Kyrie did? No, absolutely not. Now, I think you need to accept that that will make it worse. As long as you are ready for the consequences that going back at a crowd, which honestly, I mean, Medvedev has done, Djokovic has done, it, it's going to make it worse. They will now, in part, cheer harder against you. And as long as you are prepared for that to happen, then that's okay. I have no problem with that. I mean, I think that the power dynamic is sometimes a little bit a little bit messed up, you know? I mean, these players they're they're humans and they should get to react in a human way to the things that fans say to them with an understanding that uh they 
the scrutiny is going to be on them. Nobody is going to hold the fan as accountable as they are going to hold the player and that there is going to be consequences. So there's my answer. Congratulations to Gold Wolf for getting his comment in the mailbag. Uh, okay, Yashwan, has has the tour moved on from Federer? Answer this and or will you? Of course I will. I think I already kind of have. Now, I will come back to Federer when he comes back. But for the time being, of course, I think everybody's moved on from Federer. And we, we hope and patiently await that he comes back. And then we can uh, go back to experiencing Feder. We, we, we hope, I mean, everyone hopes, man. I mean, I want nothing more than for, for Roger to, uh, have some sort of satisfying comeback here. It would be fantastic for the sport. Um, but I will say this, my, uh, my girlfriend was asking me what, how many of my most viewed videos have to do with the big three. And I was like, great question. Let me, let me check that out. So this was last week. And I went to look at the YouTube analytics that showed me all of my most viewed videos of all time. And obviously the channel has grown a lot in the last two years. And in the last two years, Feder has been out of the picture. And I looked at the top 50 and the percentage of videos that have involved Djokovic or Nadal absolutely through the roof. I mean, just a, a huge number, an incomprehensible number. It is like, um, you know, it was at least 40 out of the 50 top videos ha involved, uh, Nadal or Djokovic. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, Federer has not been in the mix is I guess what I'm trying to say in, in terms of like, I, I don't even, I forget what, it's like kind of for Federer to to be heavily involved in um it's been that long that I I almost don't remember because you know the comeback last season it was it was pretty mild you know the expectations were never very high at any point for him so I don't know it's been interesting uh from Mason why does Djokovic get outlasted nowadays by some players is it due to the fact that he is no longer consistently fit? From 2011 to 2016, he would never be out rallied in 15 plus rallies by the likes of Davidovich or Zera, let alone 20 to 30 shot rallies by the likes of Medvedev or Zverev. Back to Novak's conditioning. Good question here. Um, and the answer is this to, to maintain a certain level of fitness, it requires a certain intensity in training. And a young Novak Djokovic, and other players have said this too, a young Novak Djokovic could maintain that intensity in training for uh, 12 months out of the year. And that, that wasn't a problem. As you age, you need to take rest periods. And it is no longer possible. You might be able to to uh, accomplish that intensity. You must accomplish that intensity, uh, but you can't do it for 12 months anymore. You can do it for short periods of time, and then you must let your body rest. You must even let maybe your mind rest uh, is part of it, but it's more physical. Uh, so, I mean, he has said over and over again, and Nadal has said this too, and Federer has said this too, as they've aged, that they are no longer able to maintain the physicality that they that they were able to maintain over the course of the calendar and that is why you have seen very clearly the masters have been penetrated the majors have not no you know obviously nobody's won two two majors um outside of murray and stan still yet we are seeing plenty of first time masters 1000 champions and in the case of medvedev and zverev we have seen players win multiple, multiple, multiple Masters 1000 titles, and the big three are winning them less and less and less and less, but they have still been able to peak for the majors, and obviously in recent history, we're talking about more Djokovic and Nadal, and that is because that is how they have managed their schedule. Next one from Vakash. Why do many players take a deep return position on clay? 
Conventional logic would suggest, since you don't need that extra time to return serve on clay, you'd rather take a closer position and make an early deep return. Good question. Uh, the reason for this is twofold. One, um, if you stand closer, you are not taking advantage of the slower bounce as much. Uh, there's less distance from the bounce to when you get to hit the ball. Obviously, uh, I guess the point of dropping back on clay is twofold. The first thing is that you are maximizing your defensive returning um, because you are maximizing the distance from the bounce, which is going to be slowed down to when you have to hit the ball. Um, and then the second thing is you are going to be able to defend on clay and you're in great defensive position after you hit that return far behind the baseline. And a third thing, if you hit a great return on clay, an early return, it's actually more likely to be neutralized. So what you're doing by standing in, you're decreasing your defense, your defensive returning, you're covering less of the box, and you're not rewarded for taking your return early like you are on a quick surface, where if you hit a great return, you might win the point and you might rush your opponent a lot easier. On clay, it's really difficult to rush. So what are you doing? Your offense isn't potent, your defense isn't as good, and you're not in position to defend on the next ball, as good of position to defend on the next ball. So if you drop back, um, you get the return, you get more returns in play, and you're in great defensive position. Now let's go to, let's say, grass. Let's say you drop back on grass. Well, now um, the ball doesn't lose as much speed on the bounce, so you don't have you don't get as much of an advantage from standing back, and players are still able to ace you and hit the ball past you. Plus, if you get the return in play from all the way back there, well, you're probably you probably still need to defend, but defending on grass is a nightmare. So, what did you get? You're not in a good position. Let's say you stand in on grass and you hit a great return. You're going to be rewarded for that. And now you're on top of the point. You've probably rushed your opponent like Djokovic hard, deep down the middle. You're in a good position, if that makes sense. All right, from Dawson, number 14. I got to start going faster. Where do you see Coco Goff's career ending up? Everyone has had such high expectations of her, and it often feels like she's underachieving despite the fact that she's a top 20 player at age 18. Is she okay, or does something need to change? Technique, coaching? Coco's an interesting one. I mean, her consistency is admirable. She's such a great professional. She's such a great competitor. Her results are, um, are totally satisfactory. Now, I mean, she is slightly dipping this year. You'd like to see her continue to make a step up. But I, I thought 2021 was really good from Coco. Ultimately, my thoughts on 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 golf is I'm I'm concerned about the forehand. The second serve has gotten better. That was the first thing that needed to get better, and it did. The forehand just seems to be stagnating. And I'm worried about that continuously being a blocker for her long term because obviously it's a weakness that is pretty difficult to hide. And, you know, her grip is very, very, very extreme on the forehand. Very extreme. And I would like to see her try to change it. That is a leap of faith, that's a risk. But to me, someone needs to come in and do it because I can't see the forehand getting much worse than it is. It's uh, it's a safe space. It's a, a shot that not only has some predictable directionals, but also breaks down. You know, it's not potent offensively. It is not consistent there's really nothing really good about the forehand and that's going to be a problem so i'm really hoping that she does make some changes on the technique on that side other than that she's in good good 
a good place. Look, she's a great athlete. She's got a big first serve. She's a great competitor. She's got a good backhand. So many things to like about her game. And uh, she's not that far away. But uh, the forehand's going to be a problem. And uh, I really do hope that she makes some changes there. For Max, I saw some highlights of teams return at Belgrade, and it seems like he was more willing to hit out on the backhand than the forehand, which was loopy and safe. Would you say this is expected from him coming back from injury? Not expected, but your assessment is totally right. I mean, he just wasn't going after the forehand, and um, it seems like he's really pushed his return and that he's not at 100%, but he, he still feels like it's important to get out there and, and play some matches. So... Uh, that's what to monitor, but, but I just wanted to throw that comment out there. And yeah, that's exactly what I think everybody saw from teams, uh, comeback is that the backhand looked pretty normal, but the forehand just didn't look right. Uh, from the Tempest one, Gil, do you think Kasparud can potentially win a slam and become world number one? And what do you think he needs to improve on to reach those heights? Uh, his backhand needs to be better. He needs to learn how to flatten out that shot. He needs to learn how to shorten up that shot. He needs to get better hitting open stance on that side and not hitting uh, going to the slice defense as much on when he's rushed. Uh, the return must get better on quicker courts. And I still have some questions about him mentally. He has disappointed me in too many of the biggest matches against the best players in his career. Not not every time, but too often. So I, I think there's a lot a lot of work to do for Kasper Ruud. Um today was a bad loss against Karina Busta. I mean he he uh I think a start for him would be winning a five hundred. Obviously winning a Masters. I mean he had a chance to do it in Miami. That would have been great. Couldn't get it done. But I mean, winning a clay 500 is something that I think would be a good stepping stone for him. Uh, right now, it's just 250s. So I, I think there's a lot of work to be done. From Zachary, who will become top five first, Alcaraz, Rude, or Sinner? I think easily Alcaraz. The man is number two in the race, looking great this week in Barcelona. Just beat Tsitsipas once again. Now a 3-0 head-to-head against Tsitsipas. Now 8-6 and six career versus top 10. From Aaron Smith, at this stage of Nadal's career, will he be a bit better on hard court and grass than clay? I think he prefers his forehand to get through the court faster nowadays, and his shot tolerance and endurance isn't what it was. His serve and attacking play and transition game are also great, which suits hard court. Yeah, so I said this a lot. I was saying this a lot in 2019, and I continued to say it in 2020. And I've kind of stopped saying it because I think I might have been wrong because, uh, and I'm still not sure about this, but um, all of the serve plus one play and the point shortening and the transition game, all of that works on clay. So I think it might be a matter of getting more forehands and having more time on the ball on the forehand side. He still needs time for that forehand to be as lethal as it can be. And just the ball sitting up and not bouncing low, you know, the high bounce is very important. All those considered, I, I still think it just gives him an advantage on clay. So I think even the Nadal 2.0, who's shortening points and uh, playing a lot of first strike tennis, I still think clay is better for him. I think that's something I might have been wrong on. From Swagat, uh, a couple of questions here. I'm mostly interested in the first one. Zverev and Medvedev play such a similar brand of tennis, but why is Zverev much better on clay? Uh, I think it's two things. One, the movement. I mean, Zverev defends beautifully on clay, where Medvedev's defense takes a big hit on clay, gets a lot worse. And then the second thing is Zverev still has a bigger forehand. Obviously, it's inconsistent in how often he's able to deploy it, but it's still a bigger and better forehand. And Medvedev's flat forehand, uh, he just has so much trouble on, on the clay sometimes with getting through the speedier opponents who play good defense. And Zverev doesn't really quite have that problem as much. He has it on like a smaller scale. So I do think that it can be a problem for him at times, but not to the extent that it is for Medvedev. 
may be an unpopular question, but have you tried betting on tennis? And if so, do you have any particular strategy? I uh, I have bet on tennis at times. I'm not a a, regu a regular tennis better. Um, do I have a particular strategy? I mean, I I've always kind of been a guy who uh, enjoys betting underdogs and you know looks. So obviously with betting, these numbers are really good. You know, I mean the market is sharp. You know these these people are smart. Otherwise they would be getting robbed by by betters. So um, it's you know it's finding lines that are off that are uh, you know th that's the only way to win in in betting and. I always found the easiest way for me who, you know, didn't, wasn't, you know, a numbers guy or an algorithm guy, the easiest way to find lines that I thought were off or to find underdogs who I thought shouldn't be underdogs or to find long shots who I think had a shot. Um, and then the other thing that I would say in all sports, you know, the strategy, if you want to win is you gotta, you have to be contrarian. Um, and that's just the way the gambling market works is if, uh, you know, it, it's a, it's a, it's just like the stock market. If you're betting like Carlos Alcaraz right now, you're probably not getting value because his, uh, you know, everybody, everybody's super high on him. It's, you know, trying to predict David Gaffan and betting him when he's in the dumps and he hasn't won in a while, you know, that's when you're going to, that's, that's how you're going to win. Or like betting Medvedev at, at Roland Garros last year, for example, um, that, that's a tournament that, that I was placing some, some wagers and, um, I was betting Medvedev spread every match. That's an example of something that was effective because everyone was like, and, and, you know, I, I was saying this on YouTube at the time. Everyone was so down on Medvedev on clay. I mean, people thought he would lose to Garin at Roland Garros. And I'm like, dude, I, I just, I didn't buy into that. I didn't believe in that. And I, th I thought I found some value in the public and the market just thinking that Medvedev was just going to be horrific and lose to you know, players outside the top 20 on clay. And I just didn't think that was going to happen. So I don't know. Um, racket talk. Hi, Gil. Uh, Wimbledon used to be my favorite tournament to watch, but I can't believe the bigotry and discrimination that they are showing to the Russians, uh, to the Russian players, even though they know these athletes have nothing to do with the war that Putin started. It's nothing but empty symbolism, and it's super hypocritical that it's coming from the country that colonized half the world. My country is. My question is: Do you think there will be backlash slash protest to a scale that will get Wimbledon to change their mind? And if not, do you think a lot of players will start to have a negative view of Wimbledon as opposed to the pristine view that most, ha including me, have always had? Uh, I'm gonna leave it at that. Um, an answer. Um, I do not think Wimbledon will go back on this. No, I think uh, there's two things. One, obviously, you know, if going back on your de decision, they said unless something drastically changes, something drastically changing does not constitute getting backlash. And they definitely knew they were going to get backlash because people within the All England Club had leaked this. I didn't, I for one did not take those leaks seriously. I know a lot of you guys didn't take those leaks seriously. I wasn't alone. Uh, but they knew the backlash was coming. They did it anyway. The other thing is uh, we need to be very mindful that how, what the reception and the response has been in the tennis world is different from what the response is in the general public. Us, you know, we all have an emotional chat attachment to these players, an emotional attachment to Wimbledon and to the sport of tennis. As a result, and what we've seen, I mean, we have, I've seen uh, polls in The Guardian, uh, and I have anecdotal evidence of this too. The general perception of something like this for people who do not care about tennis, do not care about these players, they are much more likely to have a positive view of the decision that Wimbledon made. 
So it's actually in the polls that have been put out, the approval ratings have been positive for this decision in the general uh, UK media sphere. In the tennis UK media sphere, they have been negative. So uh, I just think it's important to acknowledge that distinction. Um, you know, I've made my stance known. Check out the video if you haven't. Um, I, I uh, discussed my take on what Wimbledon has done, and I, I'm not in favor of it. Uh, from uh, Max Sturman, I am curious to know why Tsitsipas plays well against Verev, but not against Medvedev, even though the two have similar styles. Tsitsipas is 2-7 and seven against Medi overall, 1-6 and six on hardcourt. Tsitsipas is 7-3 and three against Verev overall, and 4-3 and three on hardcourt. Strange. I agree, it's weird. Medvedev was in Tsitsipas' head for a while. Serve return dynamic has really hurt um has really hurt Tsitsipas in the Medvedev matchup you'd think it would hurt him in the Zverev matchup as well but I actually think um Tsitsipas's serve plus one for whatever reason hasn't been as effectively neutralized against Zverev but uh I don't think I have a great answer to that I really don't I can't I can't think of a glaring reason why that is so, good question. Um, I don't know. I am going to answer two more. Two more. Uh, this one is from Death Dealer. Lovely. Gil, Nadal had five consecutive Wimbledon finals and then went on to lose six consecutive before the quarterfinals. Why is that? And do you think he'll ever win another Wimbledon? Yeah, he, he just had a lot of health issues. And then there were, was a couple of instances where I thought he didn't have health issues and that he was playing decent tennis. One of those years was uh, against Gilles Mueller. Um, and he, so, okay, knee issues, health issues. Uh, I think he was having a return crisis. You know, Uncle Tony was having him stand in and he wasn't making enough returns. And then he was playing big servers like Lucas Rousseau and Dustin Brown. Uh, I thought he was playing decently well in, I think it was 20, I think it was 16 when he played Gilles Mueller. And Mueller played incredible, uh, unbelievable in that match. So that was kind of bad luck for Nadal in terms of the draw. Um, I mean, I've just, I, I, I never saw Mueller play that well. Um, so yeah. Um... From Tours Juice, I have watched many of Emil Rusevori's games in the last couple months. I love his clean ground strokes and demeanor on the court. What is your, your opinion of Emil Rusevori, and do you think he can be a contender for a top 20 to 30 ranking at the end of the year? I do. Uh, I like him. Great player. You know, he's the kind of player you see. You're like, okay, great backhand. You look at his forehand. You, can, you say, okay, great forehand. And beyond that, there's not that much to talk about. Because his movement is average, his serve is average, not that much variety, nothing that really stands out, but great forehand, great backhand, that's going to take you far. It just is. So uh, Rusevore is a good player. I know I said last one. Let me just skim through these questions in case there are any that I really, really think I should answer. Um Do you see a, an upcoming major run for Ketsmanovic? This one's from Jane. Uh, yeah, Ketsmanovic is playing top top 20 ball. I really think so. Okay, let's end on this one because it's a fun one. It'll be a good positive way to end this one um, after the uh, negativity and the corruption that this mailbag kicked off with. Hi, Gil. Uh, assuming you've seen it all, which of the four majors has been your favorite to attend? Also, other than Indian Wells, do you have a personal favorite Masters tournament? 250, 500, 1000, whatever. Um, I have not been to the Australian Open. I need that to uh, complete my career slam. 
I am totally biased towards the U.S. Open. Totally biased. Like, it is just... U.S. Open's my childhood. It is where I forged my first live tennis memories. It is where I was a ball boy. It is now a tournament I am so grateful to call an employer as I work for U.S. Open Radio now. Um, so I'm totally biased. But... I'll compare Wimbledon and, and the French because I'm I'm not biased there, and I prefer Wimbledon. I think that it is, uh, you know, it is more. You know, I I love the, the there is a beauty of the of the red clay, but I would say the grounds are, it, it is a more special setting. It is more unique uh, between the crowds and the lack of stimulus. The no music, no sponsors, no video boards. Uh, it is it is very much a an atmosphere. Uh, but when I say atmosphere, it is uh, you know it's not atmosphere like you, you would usually think with uh, a lot going on. No, it is it is a church. Wimbledon is a church, and uh, it's something that is definitely. You know, when it comes to tournaments, the kind of one of a kind factor I think is is huge. It, it makes such a big difference. It is what is it about this tournament that makes it different? It makes it look different from all the others. You know, Monte Carlo with the beautiful scenery on the Mediterranean Sea, uh, the the size of Arthur Ashe Stadium, right? Uh, that is that is kind of what what separates these these things and i i was at i was at indian wells a couple of weeks ago and i honestly i thought you know just the way the way you, it's in the desert with the mountains and the that setting um kind of made it so great so uh, i don't know you know rome is on the bucket list i love that stadium court i think the architecture of all those courts looks so awesome and um i love rome i love rome i want to eat my way through Rome again. I was fortunate to spend a couple of days there back a um, couple years ago, but uh, I'd like to go back. So yeah, uh, I will end it on that. I hope you guys enjoyed. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you next time.